Is artificial intelligence doing more harm than good? And which industries are already being replaced by AI? And how will this impact your children and grandchildren? I'm Drenda, and this is Drenda On Guard. Let's get into it. <laughs> Today's episode will be shocking to some of you, and you won't want to miss any of it. So if you're new to the channel, subscribe and tap the notification bell so you never miss an upload. Leave a like and comment down below your thoughts, your opinions, and share this video with your friends, and especially your coworkers and those that have children. Now we have lots to cover today, so let's jump right into it. Let's talk about ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT is an AI chatbot whose original purpose was to mimic human speech and progressively learn new things as users interacted with it. But ever since its launch, just this past November 2022, the artificial intelligence has exceeded expectations in its capability and its popularity. At the time of recording this, over 100 million users take advantage of ChatGPT's features. Features that include writing computer programs, coding, writing music, creative storytelling, and answering difficult and intricate questions. As a learning machine, the more it's used, the more it learns. I know it sounds scary, right? Like something out of a sci-fi movie, but it's real and it's proven to many to be useful. So much so that certain CEOs have already begun to take notice. Companies like Wendy's, IBM, and British Telecommunications have already announced plans to implement AI instead of humans for certain positions. Goldman Sachs predicts that 300 million jobs will be lost to artificial intelligence in the near future. According to the Toronto Star, the industries most at risk for AI replacement are as follows. Data entry, background research, coding, programming, writing, finance, legal work, customer service, and driving services. In the month of May, we've already seen 4,000 U.S. jobs replaced just in one month. CBS News writes, for those wondering when AI will start replacing human jobs, the answer is it already has. Artificial intelligence contributed to nearly 4,000 job losses last month as interest in the rapidly evolving technology's ability to perform advanced organizational tasks and lighten workloads has intensified. The report released Thursday by the outplacement firm shows that layoff announcements from U.S.-based employers reached more than 80,000 in May, a 20% jump from the prior month and nearly four times the level for the same month last year. Of those cuts, AI was responsible for 3,900 or roughly 5% of all jobs lost, making it the seventh highest contributor to employment losses in May cited by employers. The job cuts come as businesses waste no time adopting advanced AI technology to automate a range of tasks, including creative work, such as writing, as well as administrative and clerical work. This AI industry is expected to grow to more than $1 trillion, fueled by major technological advancements that became apparent last fall with the launch of OpenAI's chat GPT bot, a report by Bloomberg Intelligence analysis shows. Friends, technology is advancing at a frightening pace. Facial recognition has become commonplace for many industries, and it's beginning to look like this. It may become the new normal for society. Now, recently, this happened with us. My husband and I went to France, and we saw some examples of this. It was actually pretty shocking to me, and I travel and see a lot of things, and that's why I want to bring this to you today. You need to know what's going on. So we flew to France. Our boarding pass was our face. We had to stand in front of a screen. It read our face, 
And that reading gave us the ability to get on the plane. Then when we got to Paris, there was more, right? We saw a grand opening for a Zara store. It was supposed to be upscale Zara. And I've been in that store before, so I thought that'd be kind of fun. And they were going to do a lot of perks for their grand opening day. And you're in Paris and you think fashion, right? So we go to the grand opening in Zara, walk in the door. I see some things I like. There's some beautiful things there. I start grabbing uh, different things. As a matter of fact, I realize I'm wearing a shirt that I bought there that day. So I go in, I find some different things. I grab some clothing. I think I'm going to go try this on. I very rarely do that, but I wanted to kind of check out the whole experience. So I went to try it on. And when I went to the dressing room, I wasn't really aware what was happening, but they had me stand in front of a large screen. The screen read my face, which I didn't realize was happening in the moment. It read my face. It read the clothing that I had in my hands. I went into the dressing room to try it on. It was very automated. As a matter of fact, it was one woman who got into a, a heated argument uh, with the one attendant that was in the area because she wanted to go back with her daughter and stand outside the dressing room to see her clothing, and it was not allowed because of their system, right? I didn't realize it, but what they're doing is they are attaching the items you have in your hand to your face recognition. And so now you are responsible for those items. When I came out of the dressing room, what I didn't want, I handed to an attendant and then I walked on out and I went to purchase my items. Well, on the way there, I might have been 10 foot from the actual uh, counter. There were counters all down the way. There were no attendants at any counters. I know we're all getting used to this at the grocery stores, right? One person and then there's a whole bunch of self-service counters. Well, this was a, a whole row of counters. You walk up and lay your items on the counter and immediately it calculates what you owe and you tap it with your credit card. I mean, it's an instantaneous two second process. But on the way, I handed two items to an attendant there. I was maybe 10 feet from the actual uh, the checkout, but it did not take off the two items. I happened to notice, because I'm suspicious, right? Uh, us women, we have a little suspicious nature and this is all new anyway. And I realized, wait a minute, it charged me for the two items I returned. And as soon as I told the attendant, she was like freaked out. Uh, they were all just like going in almost, uh, you know, hyper scare mode. What do we do? What do we do? And I finally just went, it's not that much money. I'll just pay for them. And I took the two items back and purchased it. And then I kind of looked at her and said, I don't know that we can replace human beings with these machines. And she kind of smiled and did, did a kind of agreement interface. Then I go from there, you know, they give us some, some nice food on the way out. They give us like this uh, incredible, delicious uh, pastry. It was almost like a, a cake on a stick, but it was ice cream and banana inside of a cake on a stick. And it was amazing. Then we go to McDonald's and the same thing. We go in McDonald's, you purchase everything with a screen. You, you don't see a person, you don't work with a person. Everything's automated and comes out. It's just totally different. So between our facial recognition to get on the plane, to purchase items in the store, I can see where you could walk in a store and there'd be no person actually working there. Or maybe there's one person who is possibly overseeing the entire store. You pick the items, you go, they put facial recognition to what you have in your hands. If you walk out of the store to shoplift, now they've got your face. But how could this be misused? How could this be? It's scary. And it is replacing jobs. I can see this very quickly turning into you can't buy or sell if you don't meet the criteria, the ESG, the environmental, social, and governance standards. If you don't uh, operate under the DEI, I call it DIE, but they call it DEI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, perhaps you stand to the screen and now you can't board the plane. And they say, eh, no, you don't fit our uh, requirements. Have you spoken out against something that we don't agree with you? You're a hateful person. You're a bigot. You're misogynistic. You're homophobic. Whatever. They could attach the social credit scores like China does to your facial recognition. This is frightening. Uh, now, we're not to be afraid, and I'll talk about that in the end, but I want you to understand what is going on? Because for us folks that are getting uh, more mature in age, we could hear things like chat GPT. We don't know what that even means. Uh, we hear social scores. We hear DEI. 
uh, let's just flip it, die. <laughs> anyway, d d diversity, inclusion, equity. We can hear these things, though, and dismiss it. We can hear about metaverse and, my, uh, you know, and Zuckerberg and this metaverse world of technology where people basically, they live in a, in a, a technological world and they're just sitting, you know, letting their physical body, their appearance, their life, their mind, their spirit go void while they live in this technological world where they have an avatar and the avatar can go to strip clubs and do pornographic things within this tech world. This is frightening and it has incredible potential for danger. It might make some conveniences, yes, but it also has incredible potential for danger, for sinful acts to replace human beings and to move humans to actually uh, trans, not only transgender, but to look at transhumanism and move themselves into receiving technology into their body to help them compete with robots. Think about the potential of all of this. Mike Rowe shared his thoughts on the matter, however, and in his opinion, there's hope for skilled workers. Rowe believes that the growth of AI in the workplace will not jeopardize blue collar jobs. He argued that these roles require particular skill sets that are difficult to replicate digitally, at least now. Here's a quote. People used to say that robots are going to destroy skilled labor. Well, not really. I haven't seen any plumbing robots. I haven't seen any electrician robots. And I don't think we're going to see any artificial intelligence in the skilled trades to that degree. So job security in the face of this rapidly evolving technology can be a little unsettling, but that might not be your biggest worry. Let's talk about scams. Scams and identity theft are among the biggest fears surrounding the new technology. And I can tell you from personal experience how believable some of these things really are. So recently we have a family, okay, we have a family text. It's a group text with all of our family on it. And it's how we kind of touch base with each other, or we remind each other of a birthday party, or renounce special things, or ask for prayer among our family members, because there's so many of us, and we're all running our race. We're busy, we're working together, but we all have a lot on our plate to carry out. So our son, Tom, who is also our creative media officer at the ministry, he shared on our family group text, an AI a replication of our daughter, Kirsten. Now, I, as a mom, I thought it was my daughter, Kirsten. So what did he do? This is the potential for this. He took a small 20-second sampling of Kirsten's voice from something we have. He took that sampling, and then he had a script he wrote, making him the hero. And he has Kirsten in her voice saying, I love my brother, Tom. He's just amazing. And this kind of thing, you know, I owe everything I know to my brother, Tom. He taught me everything I know about business. And actually, I'm going to leave my business to my brother, Tom, and goes on with this. I actually think as a mother, now, if you can fool a mother, wow. I actually think this is my daughter, Kirsten. I did think she was speaking very um, professionally, but she does that at times. And so I thought, okay, she's just making this sound very professional. Uh, but she was saying things that I thought she was being facetious and making fun of Tom. So here I am as a mother, I'm fooled. I think this is my daughter's voice and she's saying these things. And I thought, you know, I know we like to poke fun and, and kind of have some fun, but I hope it doesn't really hurt Tom's feelings. What do I find out? My son Tom actually made this AI voice to show us all the potential and how frightening this could be and how people could misuse any, of, any person's voice and make them say things they did not mean, make them say things they did not do. How could this be used in the future for politicians? How could this be used to scam someone to get their money? Uh, you know, one of your children calls you and says, hey, mom, I'm in a, ser a terrible situation, or hey, grandma, I'm here in you know, another state, and you know they went on a trip or something. Somebody looks on their social media, sees they're on a trip, makes a video, uh, you know, a recording of their voice using a sampling of their voice, and calls you and says, I am in a bad position. I need money really, really fast. Could you please overnight me $10,000? If not, this is gonna happen, or I can't get out of this country, or I can't do this, or, or I'm gone, I've gone to the hospital and they need it. 
the potential for this to scam is scary. And then on the other side of it, what if we think it is an AI scam and it's the real thing? If you're still not convinced of the dangers of AI, you might want to take a look at what other companies are doing in response to this new technology. According to Breitbart News, Apple has placed restrictions on its employees from using chat GPT and other AI services out of fear that, quote, generative AIs, while powerful, can potentially collect and share confidential data leading to a breach of our security protocols. As you know, Apple is one of the leading tech companies in the world. If anyone understands the threat that AI poses, it's probably Apple. But what are other experts saying? Steve Wozniak, Apple's co-founder, warns against the scamming potential of AI, and these scams have already begun to take the world by storm. Reuters reports that a man in northern China was scammed by a deep fake of his close friend who asked for 4.3 million won, that's like $622,000 in U.S. currency. A deep fake is when you take someone else's face and digitally place it on someone else. In this case, the AI was also able to steal the man's voice, just like what Tom did with Kirsten. The only reason this man realized he was scammed is because when he called his friend to discuss the transaction, his friend had no recollection of the conversation at all. So there's a way you can check some things out, right? You can do that due diligence to make sure. Now we've had ministry people tell us, hey, somebody contacted me and I just got a, uh, an inheritance and I have a great uncle or I have this person I didn't know about, beware. Beware, and my husband says, yeah, and they told you this, and they asked you for this, and they told you this, and they said, if you'll just send this amount of money, you'll be able to get this huge amount of money. It's just a processing fee, or it's an attorney fee, or it's be aware. These are dangerous scams to get your money. AI theft doesn't end there, however. Even celebrities have found their work being plagiarized with the new technology. Here's what Sky News reported. Social media has been awash with convincingly produced songs appearing to be featuring the voices of some of, some of music's like biggest stars, but they've been created using artificial intelligence. It's prompted some streaming services to announce it's building a set of cutting edge tools to detect AI generated content on its platform and weed out illegal and fraudulent content. It follows a song featuring the cloned voices of Drake and The Weeknd going viral in April, resulting in the track having to be removed from streaming sites. This is what AI is capable of and it's frightening. It's bringing artists back to life and changing the genre of certain musicians entirely. There are already songs being released by Michael Jackson, who has long since passed away. There's Kanye West singing country music, and even Ariana Grande singing in an entirely different language. Some artists have called for the regulation of this technology in the music industry, but it may already be too late to change course. Sadly, the dangers of deep fakes, that's a word I want you to be aware of now. You'll know when your grandkids or your kids talk about it, what is a deep fake? Sadly, the dangers of deep fakes are going beyond any theft. More than a dozen high school girls learned the hard way that even their innocent selfies could be weaponized against them. Listen up, moms. Inside Edition obtained court documents from a court case dealing with Patrick Carey, a former student at MacArthur High School in Levittown, New York. Patrick had allegedly taken normal selfies of over a dozen of his former classmates, which would be easily found on any social media. He turned them into deep fake pornography. He also allegedly posted identifying information about his victims, including their home addresses and cell phone numbers and encourage people to harass and threaten them with sexual violence. I actually had something like this happen 
to one of my daughters where someone hacked into her accounts, changed her pictures and began to harass her mercilessly on every social media platform she had. The FBI had to get involved in it. It was dangerous, it was scary, and there have even been kids who took their life because of the incredible amount of violation, fright, uh, abuse, uh, embarrassment, shame. She'd done nothing wrong. Imagine one of your kids or grandchildren, their picture being taken and used porno pornographic uh, uh, design, it was changed on it, and then that was used to harass them or make them look like they posed or did something like that. And then in addition, they put their phone number, they put their information. This hacker took 500 of his followers and had him, them attack my daughter, but he also went to prison. These girls in this event weren't doing anything suggestive in their original photos. They were just doing what any other high school student might do on any given day. Little did they know, with the help of AI technology, an innocent selfie could be turned into graphic images for the world to see. This is very, very disturbing. So, so wrong. And I can tell you as a mother and grandma, you can only imagine how angry, and I had to say, I'm gonna be angry and sin not, but we're gonna pray, we're gonna find this person, we're gonna fight, and they will, justice will be served. But many times, the FBI and other organizations, uh, they don't have the time, the wherewithal, or sometimes even the motivation to seek out these evildoers and see that justice comes. As parents and grandparents, moms and dads, we need to be aware of what these social media platforms mixed with AI and this information can be done with and what can be used to harm our families, our children, and even our jobs, careers, our ministries, our businesses, we need to be alert. And that's why today I wanted you to hear this information. And I wanna hear your thoughts too on AI. So tell me what you think in the comments below. Do you have use of any of these programs? Have they been positive in your life? And what can we do to protect our families? I'm gonna to continue to comment on that just like I did in my book, Fight Like Heaven, where I expose what can be done with the metaverse and the dangers of that for the future generations of children. We need to blow the whistle. We need to raise the alarms. We need laws. We need con congressional laws to protect the innocent with all of this technology. I believe our Congress is way behind on uh, putting in uh, positions and measures to protect us and hold those accountable in a very, very strong way who misuse these platforms and misuse AI and ChatGPT to ruin lives. Next, I want you to take a look at what Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, has to say. We're going to hear about some of those concerns now with Dr. Jeffrey Hinton, who joins me from London. Thank you for being with us. And what are you free to express now about artificial intelligence that you couldn't express freely when you were employed by Google? It wasn't that I couldn't express it freely when I was employed by Google. It's that inevitably, if you work for a company, you tend to self-censor. You tend to think about the impact it will have on the company. And I want to be, to be able to talk about what I now perceive as the risks of superintelligent AI without having to think about the impact on Google. What are those risks as you see it? There are quite a few different risks. Um, there's the risk of producing a lot of fake news so nobody knows what's true anymore. There's the risk of encouraging polarization by getting people to click on things that make them indignant. There's the risk of putting people out of work. That it should be that when we make things more productive, when we greatly increase productivity, it helps everybody. But there's the worry that it might just help the rich. And then there's the risk that I want to talk about. Many other people are talking about those other risks, including risks of bias and discrimination and so on. I want to talk about a different risk, which is the risk of superintelligent AI taking over control from people. Well, how do the two compare, human or biological intelligence and machine intelligence? That's a very good question, and I have quite a long answer. Um, biological intelligence has evolved to use very little power, so we only use 30 watts, and we have huge numbers of connections, like 100 trillion connections between neurons. 
and learning consists of changing the strength of those connections. The digital intelligence we've been creating uses a lot of power, like a megawatt when you're training it. It has far fewer connections, only a trillion, but it can learn much, much more than any one person knows, which suggests that it's a better learning algorithm than what the brain's got. Well, what would smarter than human AI systems do? What's, what's the concern that you have? Well, the question is, what's going to motivate them? Because they could easily manipulate us if they wanted to. Imagine yourself and a two-year-old child. You could ask it, do you want the peas or the cauliflower? And the two-year-old child doesn't realize it doesn't actually have to have either. Um, we know, for example, that you can invade a building in Washington without ever going there yourself by just manipulating people. But imagine something that was much better at manipulating people than any of our current politicians. I suppose the question is then, why would AI want to do that? Wouldn't that require some form of, of sentience? Um, let's not get confused with the issue of sentience. I have a lot to say about sentience, <laughs> but I don't want to confuse the issue with it. Let me give you one example of why it might want to do that. So suppose you're getting an AI to do something. You give it a goal. And you also give it the ability to create sub-goals. So like if you want to get to the airport, you create a sub-goal of getting a taxi or something to get you to the airport. Now, one thing it will notice quite quickly is that there's a sub-goal that if you can achieve it, makes it easier to achieve all the other goals that you've been given by people. And the sub-goal that makes it easier is get more control, get more power. The more power you have, the easier it is to get things done. So there's the alignment worry. We give it a perfectly reasonable goal. And it decides that, well, in order to achieve that, I'm going to get, get myself a lot more power. And because it's much smarter than us, and because it's trained from everything people ever did, it's read every novel there ever was, it's read Machiavelli, it knows a lot about how to manipulate people. There's the worry that it might start manipulating us into giving it more power, and we might not have a clue what's going on. This is scary stuff. The thought of AI manipulating world leaders is frightening enough. But if it can be controlled and programmed to do so, then some Silicon Valley executive could rule the world, and we'd never even know who it was, the Antichrist. <laughs> we need to pray and appeal to the true ruler of the world, Jesus Christ. I want to give you this thought out of Proverbs. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. Do not let the words of God depart from you, my son. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And I want to encourage us to reach out to this younger generation and encourage them. And maybe you are one of our younger viewers. And I want to encourage you to keep your heart with all diligence. Don't let yourself be deceived by all of the things that we see in our world that look exciting, enticing, in gaming, in AI, in all types of transhumanism and discussions about being a bionic person. God created you in his image and likeness, and he does not want anyone messing with your brain, your spirit, your DNA, and controlling your thoughts, controlling your voice, or controlling your belief system. Until next time, I'm Drenda, and this is Drenda on Guard. Stay on guard. We'll see you then. Please like and share this, and uh, I want to encourage you that others need to know what you know about this today.